Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the next episode in the Finding Your First Bug series. Today we're going to be talking about getting started on a target. Um, and really this is a follow-up to choosing a target, which was one of my previous videos, and really takes you on the next steps. Like you've chosen something you want to hack on, now it's time to actually work out how to start hacking. And I realise that sounds a bit odd to do as kind of like a step, it's like first you must choose a target, then you've got to figure out how to hack on a target, and then you can hack on a target. Um, so I hope this is kind of a useful um, next stages video for you guys. Um, this is going to be a bit more about bug bounty methodology and how to kind of take those steps, how to approach the problem of finding a bug. Um, so this is going to be a little bit different than my other videos, and it's going to be split into two parts, as in two separate videos. The first one is going to be this video, which is going to be about the theory. It's not really theory in the sense that it's kind of boring, busy work. It's more about how you should approach creating your own bug bounty methodology and how you should kind of what you should be thinking about and what are the important stages. Um, we're going to be talking about reading the scope and kind of understanding the scope, doing recon, what you should keep an eye out for, especially as you start to do recon, like what are you actually looking for when you do recon. Um, how to prioritise likely bug spots, how to take notes, and how to understand what you have. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit about what to do if you find a bug, and what to do if you don't find a bug, and want to give up. And so part two will be the demo of what I think about when I hack. Um, that's going to be more about me choosing a target and narrating my thought process, and how I approach targets and perform recon, and how I take notes and how I manage burp. Um, you don't have to watch the demo video if you're just not interested which is why i separated them because this video is going to be far more about bug bounty methodology and things to think about as you'd kind of develop your own bug bounty methodology while the demo was just a lot of people were interested in my thought process and how i think about you know these problems rather than um specifically me telling you how to hunt for bugs and um, because i think it's much more useful to kind of create your own and to know what you're looking for um, than to li listen to someone else say this is what I looking listen look for and what I'm looking out for. Um, so this is part one, creating your own bug bounty methodology. Because no one can tell you what method of bug hunting works best for you. I want to make that very clear that there is nobody who can come up to you and say this is ha this is the foolproof method for hunting bugs because it doesn't exist because you are different people you might approach problems differently, you might approach, um, you know, you have different skill sets, maybe you're already in security and you're very technical, maybe you're not in security and the only experience you have is web development. Those are completely different worldviews that just don't always collide. So you need to create a methodology that works for you. Um, so you've chosen your target and you're probably asking yourself, what should I even do first? Which asset should I hack on? Do I need to do recon? How do I even do recon? What should I look for? What am I actually doing here? And I'm going to validate those feelings and say, that is very overwhelming. And I understand. Um, it is super overwhelming to just be given this massive list and told, okay, now hack it. Um, so what we want to really do is create a plan. So this whole video is on creating your methodology. And why do we have a methodology? Well, because having one will help you organise your thoughts and ensure you won't miss anything. Um, it's super easy to get so caught up in hacking that you just miss really obvious stuff. Um, and also, it's difficult to manage, you know, a web app that is huge or that has thousands of endpoints and you just don't know what to do next. So, in this video, we're going to cover looking at the assets in scope and kind of understanding scope and what that means. Recon, um, so how to, how to do recon, what you're even looking for when you do recon, um, filling up burp with every single endpoint you can, how to figure out which of those is valuable, what to test for when you find the valuable endpoints, and how to take notes so you know you're not missing anything. Uh, I'm going to go over at the very end stuff about giving up and when, you know, when is it time to actually give in. Um, so first we're going to talk about assets so okay right assets are the things that are in scope if you watch my previous video on choosing a target i talked quite in depth about how to choose a program based on what's in scope 
Um, this is really going to be a kind of recover of that with a focus on actually hacking. Um, so once again, you should be aware what's in scope and out of scope. You should never go out of scope. A lot of people think going out of scope means, you know, you get big payouts or uh, you can get crazy bugs if you go out of scope. Uh, what you're more likely to do is get a legal issue and have your issues closed and never pay out. Um, so the reason why scopes exist is because that's the permitted test surface. As soon as you go out of that permitted test surface, that's when you're hitting the kind of legal issues. If you find a bug there as you're using an app, that's quite a different um, experience to if you're specifically testing on some on an asset that's out of scope. So you really shouldn't go out of scope. Not a, not not at all if you're actually testing for stuff. Um, so that's my first warning: don't go out of scope. Um, and you want to be picking ass assets which have a high amount of user interaction. Now, the more user interaction an app has, the more likely it is to find bugs. You can find bugs in um, just kind of more static websites. But what you're going to find is that the kind of bugs that exist there are way more technical. They, ex they expect you to know far more about what the app is kind of running in the back you know it's knowing that wordpress has a wp admin folder um so i'm not saying they don't have bugs i'm saying it's unlikely for you to find a bug as a beginner on assets that just don't have a lot of user interaction because there's not a lot you can really poke at um and different apps have different bugs you know if you've got a store you can try business logic if you've got a lot of complex user roles especially if you've got kind of an admin a manager uh, a user and a guest um, you can try and find idols there and that's also the case for anything that has a lot of resources you know you're really going to be looking for idols and if there's lots of reflective input like forum you're looking at cross-site scripting now, if you've got a specific bug that you want to find or that you're really good at finding, you can start to choose assets based on that. Um, but I'm going to take the assumption that you don't necessarily know what bugs you want to find yet. So, the first one is, right, what's in scope and what's out of scope. Now, you can download the burp config file to make this easier. So, that's the first thing we want to consider. We want to make sure we're not going out of scope if we can help it. And if we do go out of scope, we're not testing on an out of scope domain. We're using it for recon. We're using it to better understand um, the app that is in scope. We're using it for another reason, but we're not performing any security testing on it. Uh, and Burp will make this really easy because HackerOne has the Burp configuration file that will put uh, domains out of scope and won't record the traffic in Burp. So what are the best assets to begin with? So you've got a kind of two sides one is the type of app versus the type of bug you can find now i just discussed about you know you can find business logic errors in stores you can find idols in complex user roles um in general it's better to start with an app that has plenty of user interaction however if you're a beginner i would recommend looking for something like idols looking for something like business logic errors and focusing on apps that are likely to have those two bugs in there because they don't require a lot of security knowledge. I've got videos on them if you want to learn more. Uh, they pay out. They do pay out. They're not like terrible bugs that get you like a load. They are good bugs. Um, and choose something really that this is going to sound really bad that you can actually hack. Like don't overestimate your abilities and don't assume that you can hack something like paypal when you're just starting out um because the, there's definitely bugs in paypal are there bugs that you're going to find in paypal probably not right probably you need more experience that kind of thing um so the next step is really to explore everything in scope and find one you like uh this involves just visiting the websites visiting the apps downloading them how do they work what are they kind of doing you're not really recording traffic to rank these. You're just more trying to understand what they do, um, what kind of interaction they have. You know, are they interesting to you? I think a lot of people forget that 
a lot of hacking is about, you know, does this interest me? Do I already know how this works? Uh, and you should be writing your observations as notes. We'll discuss note taking a little bit later in this video and what you should be taking notes on and how you should take notes. Um, but in general, you know, you want to take some basic notes about what kind of app it is. Uh, I've kind of done a kind of example here where you can go through like Huffington Post. Okay, so it's low interaction. All you can do is comment. Uh, I don't really know if that's going to be right for me. Okay, so Flurry. Okay, it's a big app with user interaction. However, it requires me to have an app that I can install this instrumentation on. So although it's a big app with user interaction, maybe it's not best for you to hack on because you don't know how to make a mobile app to test it. Uh, Yahoo Mail, maybe you're going, okay, small app with user interaction. However, the it's got a small amount of endpoints and I just can't like work out. I'm not an, I'm not an expert in like Android apps. I can't take that to the next level and start to exploit it. Uh, Yahoo Fantasy Sports, once again, lots of user interaction. A uh, big app, maybe you're super into fantasy sports. You can be like, yeah, I want to I wanna hack that because that's interesting. And you who were the once again low interaction. So what we're really noting here is how suitable an app is for you to hack on. Um, and maybe for you, you know, maybe you're an Android developer and you already know a lot about Android instr instrumentation and you know how to hack them because of your job. In which case, this doesn't apply to you. You should look and evaluate things in a different way. Um, my aim really is just to get you thinking about how you create your own methodology and what you should be thinking about not necessarily here's what you should be writing down verbatim um and i think this is a question a lot of people end up asking um but maybe we're a bit too scared to properly ask it which is how hard this is an asset to hack how do i know i'll actually be able to find a bug before i waste my time and once again this is really difficult to know for your first bug like this is super difficult because you just don't know how hard, you don't have enough experience with different assets to know if you can hack it. Um, so my advice is really to look at some of the easiest bugs to find. Uh, and I've IDOS, Business Logic, Cross-Site Scripting, CSRF, and then look at the requirements of that, that sort of demands of an app. Uh, I mentioned this in my first slide, but this can give you an, another idea of not just what to hack on, but also how difficult it is to hack. If you want to find idols, you need a, an app with a large API and a number of resources. You know, it's not going to be enough to have a web app that is like something very basic, like a very basic version of Twitter where you have users tweets and that's it, right? There's, there's only two types of resources. You want something that has a lot of weird um, like API endpoints. You want to have um, different versions of APIs maybe. So as you look and kind of start to evaluate it's worth looking at the bugs you're able to find and as you get more experience you'll of course know what bugs that you can find and know what you're able to do um, but at the beginning I'd recommend sticking with the kind of bugs I mentioned in my series I don't just pick them randomly for fun I do actually have a reason to pick them um, because I do think they're quite easy to find uh, and the next one to really consider is how difficult impact is to prove now I, this sounds really weird but what I'm trying to say here is when we look for security vulnerabilities, we're actually looking for something that's valuable for an attacker, right? It's not good enough for it to just be an idol. It's an idol that can be exploited in an interesting way and that could actually have some impact. Um, so for a lot of kind of apps, it's difficult to prove impact, right? It's difficult to say, yes, this will impact your business. Um, so you can also think about, okay, if I was hacking this, if I found a vulnerability, what kind of impact could I get? Um, financial impact is usually the easiest to describe. It's very easy to convince somebody that they're doing something wrong if they lose money from doing it. Um, alternatively, for the more security focused stuff, we have being able to modify an account, being able to log in as somebody else, being able to change something about someone else's account without them knowing is quite you know, quite big on the whole um, some more security impact. So as you're looking at assets and going, okay, how difficult is this to hack? If you keep in mind, can I find the bugs that I know how to find? Can I prove impact if I find one? This is the two 
considerations you should be thinking about. Um, and you may not be able to tell, honestly, you, you may not be able to tell how easy or how difficult a target is before you really get started and start to give up. But we're going to go over that later. So for the moment, just keep that in mind. Um, next kind of question when it comes to scope is what kind of bugs a program is looking for. Um, sometimes a program is looking for specific bugs. So sometimes you have out of scope bugs. This is from Verizon's um, page where they list a bunch of out of scope bugs. Now, if you see bugs that you can find like easily on this list, the program is probably not very suitable for you. Um, it's unlikely because these tend to be more out of scope because they're very small or have no security impact. Um, we have kind of self XSS, which requires somebody to put in a payload. Um, we have kind of automated scanners, which are just kind of lazy. Um, known vulnerability vulnerable library without proof of exploitability you know these have no security impact unless you can prove it um and then sometimes you'll see that a low um a low bounty is like 50 dollars, but like a medium is like 500 and with those they're really looking for higher bugs like those crits and those highs maybe they're much higher um so it's worth checking that there's nothing that you can find that's excluded although those tend to be more they aren't really bugs more than um more than you know you get your actual bugs there uh, and sometimes a program is looking for more critical bugs like rcs um maybe they just don't have that much money in their bounty pool and they want to save it for those really big bugs that are going to be like changing their way they work so this is kind of uh, a, a brief overview of uh, like looking at something and choosing assets. Um, so let's have a chat about recon next. So recon, reconnaissance, is not just in um, something that you do, but also something an attacker does as well. And that's worth keeping in mind as you perform recon. Um, so I don't really like recon. However, I've done some research. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you about recon despite not doing it myself. Uh, and I'm going to tell you what to watch if you actually want to learn more about recon. But I thought I'd include this because I think it's a really important part of the bug bounty process. Um, even if the way I do recon is very different to the way most other people do recon. Um, so the point of recon, and you're doing recon whenever you find out more information about a target. Wherever you purposefully make the effort to find more. Um, so what kind of stuff does that include? We have extra assets, assets that don't necessarily um, appear on the scope list. Now they could be out of scope assets, they could not be out of scope assets. It depends on the program rules. We can brute force directories, um, especially useful in something like an API when you're trying to find more resources. You can get these giant lists of API endpoints uh, and just run that on your target. Uh, we can find credentials. Um, so with credentials, I'm going to go over this in more detail, but with credentials, you really have to exploit them to be able to report them because they could be old. Um, we have identifying new slash old features. You know, new features might have less testing, less hackers have been using them. Um, old features, we might get something that has a lot less security testing kind of apply to it during the development time so when we do recon our aim is really to better understand the target to understand an asset better to understand the infrastructure of a target so their dns their uh, certificates etc or to find new assets that perhaps aren't listed on the program page and we do this automatically and manually you know automatically we can use burp we can use lazy recon um, manually we can do some google dorking we can do a github search that kind of thing so let's talk about automatic recon so the easiest way to do automatic recon um, is using burp intruder and i say this because a lot of people say that lazy lazy recon is easier 
Lazy Recon is easier in the sense that you press a button, however more difficult to interpret the results if you don't know what you're doing. Um, using Burp Intruder is a lot easier to kind of just put out there and kind of understand the results well. So these are, first thing I've got here is FuzzDB Discovery, which has a ton of useful API endpoints and file paths to look for. On the side, we can see a bunch of PHP files that are very common. We have your kind of WordPress logon file. We have an index. We have some um, database install scripts that haven't been um, properly removed. So when we're doing this, we're looking for API endpoints. We're looking for um, files that don't necessarily get called by our main page, but that actually still exist on the server. Um, and then payload all the things. So this has a ton of useful information. So it has some resources, it has some endpoints, but it also has a lot of information on passive versus active methods of recon. So I highly recommend um, reading up on that. If you don't understand it, it's okay. It, a lot of that stuff is very technical and stuff like DNS and um, certificates. Uh, if you do want to experiment more with that, perhaps Lazy Recon might be better for you. So Lazy Recon kind of bundles a bunch of tools together um, in a kind of a nice package where you just run one command. Uh, if you find that overwhelming though, do not worry. We also have manual recon. Um, so we have Google Dorking, which is cr crafted Google searches. We use things like Insight, in URL, in text. Um, the main use is usually to find credentials or like alternate stuff like uh, looking at Trello is very useful. Next, we have doing GitHub queries, same kind of idea, but instead, since we're looking at code, we're looking for API keys, secret keys, any kind of passwords in there. And finally, we have the App Store. So this is well, those are more about finding credentials or information. The App Store is more about kind of learning about the app, find new functionality, basically. You can also do this by just exploring kind of a blog page. You can look at the program scope and see what's changed. There's different ways to do recon um, than just running these automated tools that does do it for you. So if you want to learn more about recon from somebody who actually knows what they're talking about, uh, I highly recommend um, this talk, which is It's the Little Things um, by Nahamsek. If if you, I'm sure he's done it a bunch of different times though. So if you find that that one looks kind of terrible quality, I'm sure if you Google Nahamsek Recon, you'll find a lot. And he produced this great uh, visualization on what Recon is and stuff like that and a visual guide to it. So he's very, very good at Recon. Um, so just briefly then, how do we actually use Recon? Like what? what's the point of doing Recon? Um, so the first thing is that recon can take many different forms. You're doing recon when you learn more about a target, no matter how you're doing that. I just want to validate that because I feel like a lot of the time people want recon to only be running these complex tools and grepping through the results and looking at the screenshots. But actually, there's quite a lot you can do from just Googling stuff, right? You don't need to use all these tools. And there's a lot of hackers who just don't use technical forms of recon, who just prefer to look for themselves, look at the most recent updated, look at GitHub commits if it's an open source project, etc, etc. It takes so many different forms and you don't have to use these specific forms to be doing recon. Um, however, I thought I'd just briefly talk about what you're actually looking for in recon. So you're looking for something interesting and before you've developed your intuition, um, your ability to look at something and go, that doesn't look right. Um, you're really not sure what you're looking for. Um, so you're looking for something interesting. And what do I mean by interesting? Well, I mean something that just looks odd to you. Um, I've listed some examples here, but there might be something else that just, in your gut, you just think, that doesn't look right. That doesn't look right. That looks weird. So the first thing we have here, weird website, random login or something that should be internal only, 
uh, those are great things you can find with like lazy recon where you get the screenshots you can see what's on certain websites um, when we look at kind of doing uh, more stuff with burp you know is there an, a version of an api that's still available is there a version one that has security vulnerabilities that still accesses the same resources as the newer versions um, can you find an api that isn't called by the main web app you know maybe it's called internally maybe it's just left there by accident um, and then finally with our google docking we're looking for leaked credentials that actually work so really we're, we're taking this and we're adding it to our list of potential targets, like potential assets we want to hit or potential avenues we want to explore. Um, and we should be writing all this down. So I'm, I'm no expert in recon and this is very, very brief about what recon is. I highly recommend if you're more interested, if you're interested in recon and learning more, you should really go check out somebody who knows what they're talking about. I will say though, if you find something in recon that doesn't make it a bug you have to exploit something you find recon isn't a process where bugs just fall out onto your lap gift wrapped in a nice little present so you can open it and get some money recon is far more about finding something that people didn't know existed and then exploiting it rather than just finding something someone exists someone didn't know existed and getting paid for it um, right, so I'm going to talk about now, once you have your recon, once you have your target you've chosen, how to choose an asset to hack. Um, and you really want to have an idea of the assets that you can hack on before you start. So whether that's notes, whether that's just you poking around or finding the first one you see. Um, so once you have an idea of what assets you have, you can choose one. Um, you should choose an asset that you have the best chance of finding a bug on, like I discussed before. Um, it seems like really simple advice, but this can be really tricky, and I'm going to go over where to give up. Um, I'm including this after the point on recon, because in the recon phase, you can find more assets. Um, so you can pick something with user interaction that's not too large that you can understand it. Personally, I pick the first asset that meets, it, meets the requirement and looks interesting. I really don't do a huge amount of kind of recon and figuring out what to hack i just like to get started on on the first thing i see and the first thing that works especially if i'm dealing with like mobile apps where i've got different versions of android i just prefer to just you know i'll just i'll pick the first one <laughs> right so you've 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 got your list of assets you've done some notes you've done some recon and it hasn't changed your idea you've chosen an asset what do we do next right so we're gonna learn about the asset um so once we have an asset we need to know what it does um and you should be able to answer these kind of questions what does it do like how are people actually using it does it have a database behind it is this is this using an api um you know you want to learn not just about the kind of technical implementation you also want to learn about the business logic because that will help you prove impact later. Um, so spend some time just poking the application. You know, this can be a kind of litmus test. So try a basic payload and see if it's being filtered. What kind of filtering does it have? Um, as you kind of look, you can look at OWASP. And I'm going to go over this more in my cross-site scripting video, but there's quite a lot of bypasses for certain filters. So you can try that. You can try a basic SQL injection. You're just trying to become more familiar with the app and try and figure out what bugs are there. You know, what kind of, what, what, is there SQL injection there? Is there XSS there? Is, you know, is there a lot of resources? We're just trying to give it a little poke. We're not even necessarily doing a huge amount of security testing. We're literally just there, poke, see what comes out. Um, so the first thing you want to learn is the regular flow of the program. So how is the application supposed to work under normal conditions? Now, you should just pretend to be a user and just use the application. You know, if it's a store, add something to your cart, go through the process. Does it require payment? What kind of payment gateway does it use? You don't actually have to buy anything, but it just helps work out what a user can do and what endpoints the app is hitting. Um, 
Now, if you have an idea of what endpoint a user is going to hit in the normal use case, um, it's very really useful things like cross-site scripting. Because in cross-site scripting, when we want to reflect uh, input, we need to or reflect kind of our JavaScript and get our alert one box. What we really want to do is put that in a place where a user will actually click on it. <laughs> There's no point having it on a random page that no one will ever see. We want it to be something a user is going to hit. Um, or sometimes business logic errors where you want to understand the steps that someone can take because you want to break them. If someone's adding something to their cart and then going to a payment gateway, can we skip the payment step? That kind of level of um, working out the steps and then working out what we can break. Uh, and this is really important to learning about the application. It will give you an idea of the bugs that might exist there just from understanding how a user will use the application. Uh, and it's really useful in the future for looking at things like um, impact when you understand the web app. Uh, so the next stage after we've kind of poked the application, done our litmus test, then done a little bit more about how a user would use it, is to fill up Burp with as much stuff as we can possibly find. Um, we want to press all of the buttons. You want to find everything you have access to. Um, and it's useful for plenty of bugs, but especially idols. Idols, you want to hit a modify, read, write. You want to find as much as you can. Um, and as you do this, you can do some fuzzing. You can do some discovery here as you kind of fill out an API endpoint. But you want it to be as full of stuff as you can. Uh, and once you do that, you want to try and map your high-level functions from the previous step two API endpoints. So you can really start to understand how the programmer has gone ahead and gone, okay, so a user goes from this state to this state to this state, and you can map that as, okay, it hits that endpoint, which must change the state. Now this will give you plenty of likely areas to poke, right? This will give you so much information, you'll be very overwhelmed. Um, but this is where we're gonna look for bugs. This, after we filled up Burp with everything we possibly can, this is where we want to look for bugs. So the next step is really how to prioritize this. Um, so we have this huge list. We have, um, you know, it's totally massive. We don't know how to deal with it. Um, and the question is, how do we prioritize endpoints? So some methods which might be good for you is ones that look strange or different to others. Maybe everything else uses post and get, but one thing uses put, however, another app that does, another um, endpoint that does the same thing doesn't use put. Why does that one use put, right? Um, an endpoint with a large number of parameters, you know, the more parameters there are, maybe you can start to mess about with those parameters, start to fuzz them, see what happens. Um, endpoints that are linked to logic, so account changes or payment gateways are great places to look for kind of your IDORs, your uh, CSRF or your business logic errors um, and the final one is endpoints you've seen before which won't necessarily apply to you if you've never done any hacking before but if you're a developer you might see things like WordPress quite common and know some of the endpoints um, but this is just some ideas right you can just test every endpoint if you're looking for something like IDORs you want to test everything because there's a ton of stuff you need to test for unauthenticated uh, un unauthenticated 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 um, a regular user um, like a low permission user or an admin accessing someone else's stuff so it's really up to you how you choose to prioritize stuff as you learn more about hacking especially when you deal with apis and endpoints you'll start to develop your intuition more and it's one of the most important skills you can develop as a hacker is your intuition like knowing something doesn't look right um, but also it's not something anyone can teach you, right? It's something you've just got to learn for yourself. So these are some things you can do. As you get started, I'd focus more on linking stuff to logic because logic is something someone can actually understand. So, okay, so what are we actually looking for as we are managing these endpoints and looking at all these really overwhelming things? So here's what I keep an eye out for. Um, there's a bunch of other things you can keep an eye out for, but I think these are like four of the most important things to look for. Forms that do not have a CSRF token or 
any other kind of randomized token, um, they're often vulnerable to CSRF. Now, there's a video on CSRF coming very, very soon. Um, I just have to record it. <laughs> this is a running theme. It's my recording day. Um, but those can be great, like, for finding, especially if you can find stuff like uh, email address editing, that's always very good for CSRF. Um, and if you can chain that with cross-site scripting, you've got a really nice bug you can package up and that will get you money easily. So next one is APIs. Now APIs that take in an ID of some kind often contain idols um, because there's no validation that the ID actually exists uh, or the ID is able to be edited by that person. Um, but sometimes APIs can disclose more information than the web app displays. Like sometimes the web app may only dis display uh, a username, but actually you can return that user's uh, address, that user's payment information, even though the web app is only disclosing one part, the API is disclosing a lot more. Which are two kind of bugs to look for when you're dealing with APIs. But there's another video on APIs coming um, next week that will be more information on what, how to approach API testing. Um, and you can fuzz APIs to find more endpoints. Um, this is super useful, or even just playing with uh, the parameters, right? If you can find an API endpoint that perhaps you shouldn't have access to because it isn't being called by the web app, but actually doesn't really interesting, there's, there's a lot you can do there. Um, next one is GraphQL endpoints. So, GraphQL is a language which is very similar to the way APIs work, it's basically returning information back. Um, however, unlike an API where you have to fuzz the endpoints, GraphQL you can use introspection to just get them to tell you the endpoints that exist. Once again, super useful for IDORs and information disclosure, um, but even easier. If you want to learn about GraphQL, I highly recommend the Hacker 101 levels on GraphQL. Um, that literally took me from knowing nothing to knowing how to make a GraphQL query. And then, like, a week later, I found my first GraphQL bug. So, it does help. Um, the second one is UI only validation checks. Um, if the kind of site uses a lot of JavaScript, maybe you can't type in a um, XSS payload because it's being blocked by a filter, but actually um, it will work uh, if you run it directly in burp, right, on, in repeater, um, because it's only being done client side. Um, this can also be useful for finding business logic errors where something like quantity might only be implemented client side. Um, so look out for cross-site scripting. SQL injection, it's still quite rare nowadays to find SQL injection. Um, just because it's it's so publicised as such a uh, dangerous bug, you just don't see it as often because it's protected against. But maybe the filter isn't fully implemented. Maybe there's something there, right? All right. So let's talk about taking notes. So this is my own notes. Um, so you should keep track of your endpoints you find and test. How you do it is up to you. It is completely dependent on how things work. I recommend just trying things out and seeing what sticks for you. Um, some people like spreadsheets, some people like mind maps, some people like post-it notes. If you're like me, you like a um, complete and utter mess of a Word document <laughs> um, that has information in it, apparently. Um, and you want to keep track of endpoints that you've tested for certain things, especially as you're looking for IDORs manually. You'll basically want to just check off every single endpoint. Like, have I tried it with the unauthenticated? Does it work? No. Have I tried it with a user? Does it work? No. Um, so on the other side is my notes. So at the top, I have kind of likely bugs and what I'm kind of expect how I'm expecting to find them. Um, I then have a bunch of endpoints I want to test or just keep track of, like they don't get lost in burp. Uh, my credentials, that kind of thing. So that's how I take notes. It's very haphazard. <laughs> it's not very well organised. Um, I apparently have a degree, and in my degree I had to take notes, but apparently I haven't really learned how to do that yet. Um, but it will be how you take notes will be very dependent on you and how your brain works. Like my brain is very much a haphazard mess of information um, that eventually comes out and produces something, which is why I like my haphazard 
note-taking idea. But maybe you're actually more organised uh, and want to use a spreadsheet. Um, the one I really recommend, if you are looking for idols, just use a spreadsheet because it'll be much easier to test everything you need to test if you use a spreadsheet. Um, even I would use a spreadsheet if I was specifically looking for idols. Uh, right, so I want to answer a few questions about what if I do and what if I don't find a bug? Because I don't think that that's talked about widely enough. So the first question is, what if I don't find a bug? What if I try really, 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 really hard and I do everything right and there's just nothing coming out? Well, I spent like an hour on this um, and I just nothing, nothing even looks anything close to a bug that I can find. Um, so the question really, what you're asking is when should you give up? And it sucks that you have to give up. But sometimes a target is beyond your skill level. It's okay to recognise when you can't do it. Like, when you're li literally there and looking at your, like, task objectively and going, this is beyond my skill level, I want to stop and move on to something that is in my skill level. It's okay to give up. Honestly, people will tell you, never give up, never give up. If it's beyond your skill level, give up, because there's no point wasting your time. It's going to make you really unmotivated, it's going to make you really tired, and it's going to make you feel terrible. Before you give up, however, make sure you really have exhausted em everything, right? There's no more endpoints to test, you've tried everything you know how to try with your current set of endpoints, you can't find business logic errors because it's just too solid, maybe you've asked for help and you still can't find anything. It's okay to be stuck if you really have exhausted everything. Um, my recommendation is always to try and pivot. So if you're working on one program and you're stuck with, a, uh, with an application, sit down, pivot to another application that's in the same scope and see if that helps either give you ideas, gives you more motivation, really gets you back in focused. However, if you do choose to give up, keep your notes always keep your notes your notes will be the most valuable thing you ever own when you do bug bounties like i've spoken to some of the top hackers and the number one thing they say is they always keep notes of their current of their older targets and always keep track of their old bugs and that's what helps them find new ones um, and especially as you become more experienced you can go back and you can look at what you've learned and you can be like okay I know what to do. I know what I've already exhausted. Um, and make sure to record your thought processes as well. Now, it's really hard to know what you were thinking from just haphazard notes. Um, because you don't know what you're... You can't get back to that track, especially if you look at a later date. It's very difficult. So it's worth giving yourself a paragraph to just explain what you were doing, why you were doing it, what your motivation for doing it was, like, oh, I found a weird endpoint and I was testing for idols because this doesn't actually appear on the app, right? That's the kind of logic you want to go with. Um, you can learn, you can take what you've learned on this target and put it to a new target. You know, every single time you get stuck at a brick wall, you're actually just learning more and more about hacking, how to approach hacking, what works for you and what kind of targets work for you. So don't feel like you can't give up if you need to, because you absolutely can, and you should. You should give up if something's beyond your skill level. Um, so that was really depressing. What if I do find a bug? What do I do now? I found something. It's weird. What do I do? I'm so excited. Um, so the next step is exploitation. You cannot just report a bug unless you're able to exploit it in some way. Um, so some steps that you might want to do is something like um, making a bug more easy for someone to exploit it. If an idol requires an ID, finding that ID easily, whether that's with a low privileged account, whether that's with um, kind of being able to find a API endpoint that returns back IDs for you. It's doing that extra little step that will give you that extra little bit of money, right? So you want to be able to exploit it as much as you can. Um, escalating a bug, you know, if you have cross-site scripting, write a script that lets you take over the account. Because that's a much scarier prospect than being able to put in alert one. 
um, if, if you need to abuse a business logic error, actually writing a script that does it. Um, this is good practice when you start hacking because security threats can feel really virtual to people, right? They don't feel real just because you're able to put, put in like a few steps on a proof of concept. You need to be able to say, look, and this is what I can do with it, right? This is how I can exploit this to gain access. And this is really good when you start hacking because when you start to exploit bugs and chain bugs, that's when you get the big money, right? This is what the top hackers do. They don't just stop when they find XSS. They keep going. They keep looking at how they can chain that, how they can get more impact from it, how they can do more with it. Um, and the more you do this, the more money you will make because a lot of people will pay based on the impact that a bug has, not necessarily the type of bug it is. Uh, speaking of which, understand your impact. So if you do find something, fantastic, congratulations. And I mean that very sincerely, right? If when you find a bug, there is a rush like no other, it feels amazing, you feel so confident. Um, but before you report it, you need to understand the impact. Remember, businesses don't really care about a pop-up that says one on their website. They care about how this will impact their customers or their business. Um, an IDOR's impact is not just that there is an IDOR, but that an unauthenticated user can edit something for an authenticated user. Like, I think that's a very important thing to say, which is that the, you've got to jump into their world, right? Their world is their business, their customers, you need to place your findings in their world for them to understand the real impact. Um, so you've got to understand about them what an app does, what the bug is, how it impacts their user, how expensive a bug being exploited could be, etc, etc. So what you're really asking is the who, what, why, how, right? Those questions, but don't just place it in your view of security, place it in their view of um their business their customers maybe you know if it's information disclosure you're looking at legal implications like gdpr not just a hacker being able to do something but actually them not meeting their requirements for data protection um and this is going to be super brief uh but report writing so when you write a report you'll be asked for a section called proof of concept which is this kind of free text section you need to write clearly and concisely like you have to write in as clear as possible because the person who reads this may not actually be technical um and they may not live in your world of technical things uh and the steps to reproduce and the impact are the critical sections of the report they really are the most important um, I'm going to go into detail about report writing and especially impact because I think impact is so, so, so under talked about, not really discussed. And it's one of the most important things about um, report writing and how you actually get paid for a bug. Um, you should also include any screenshots or videos to help the reader understand, especially if English isn't your native language. Um, a picture tells a thousand words and it's true. So I hope you have enjoyed this video as a look of bug hunting methodology um, and how to get started on the target. The next video will be all about um, how I approach a target and what I do. Um, so I hope you find that interesting. I hope you find it useful. I hope you found this video useful. Um, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.